Good evening and welcome to Regis University for a keynote and panel discussion on the nuclear legacy of Rocky Flats. I'm Dr. Abby Schneider, the Director of the Sustainable Economic and Enterprise Development or SEED Institute here in the Anderson College of Business and Computing at Regis University. Before we begin tonight's program, I wanted to thank a number of people without whom this event would not have been possible. Thank you to Kellen Soroff, Luca Pawanga, and the Provost Council for their support nominating and confirming tonight's Chester Alter Scholar. Thank you also to Carl Straka, Casey Weeks, and their team in ITS, Ludi Avara and the team in Marcom, Tiffany Collier and Harvest Table, Jeff Harefield and the Bookstore, Leslie Bergina, and Susan Roberson, Jasmine Rolat, Tahera Kassam, and officers Lance Jones, Ali Hussein, and Damian Phillips for their event support. Finally, this never would have been possible without the dedication and impeccable organization of Sandy Wojciechowski, to whom I am greatly indebted. Thank you so much to this amazing team of colleagues. I also wanna thank all of you for joining us tonight. It has been very eye-opening for me to learn how many of you in the audience, including many of my colleagues, worked at or on projects related to Rocky Flats and or had family members who did. The amount of knowledge and experience in this room is incredible, and I hope you will engage in a lively Q&A after the panel discussion and talk with our panelists during the reception. To submit questions, you can either use the QR code here on the left um, or follow those instructions and go to menti, that's M-E-N-T-I dot com, and submit the code 79575967, and that code is also up on the screen. Um, if you prefer, you can also handwrite your questions on the index cards that were available at sign-in and submit them in the basket up in the front next to Nathan. Um, we'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but due to time constraints, we may combine similar questions. Um, and again, we invite you to speak with our panelists during the reception. Of course, this issue elicits a lot of passion and different perspectives, so we just ask that everyone participate respectfully and professionally. With that said, we will begin tonight's program with an extended clip from Havy Pro Cinema's forthcoming documentary based on the book, Full Body Burden. We could see the water tower from our back porch. My mother thought for years that they were making scrubbing bubbles. But of course, they weren't making scrubbing bubbles. Rocky Flats produced more than 70,000 plutonium pits for nuclear weapons. I'm not an activist. I'm a writer, I'm a journalist, I'm a historian. And what I wanted to do was tell the whole story of Rocky Flats through the eyes of the people who lived it. I was concerned that we were working to forget. In 1961, the Joint Chiefs of Staff expected that the result of their own plan, if they carried it out, would be to kill some 600 million people. Every one of these bombs, trigger is made at Rocky Flats. How much power do we want to give our government in the name of protecting us? Nuclear defense is our only defense against uh, aggressive uh, countries in the world. I think it is a part of an established uh, defense posture that uh, is required to, to maintain the current balance of power. So we're not going to keep our freedom. We don't maintain our defense. Many of the workers were proud to call themselves Cold War warriors. Those of us who lived just down the road from Rocky Flats, we didn't know that we were on the front line of the Cold War. The contractors at Rocky Flats 
were pushed by the Department of Energy to produce more and more, faster and faster. We had spills and leaks that happened just all the time. And you couldn't survive if you thought about it all the time. So we went into this culture of denial. We knew it was dangerous, but those paychecks were really nice. Well, plutonium is nasty stuff. It's well known to be a carcinogen. Rocky Flats was not placed in an ideal location, upwind of large population centers. On Mother's Day, May 11th, 1969, we were out having Sunday brunch. We had no idea that there was a fire at the nuclear bomb factory. We did not know that there was a radioactive cloud passing over our head. Over a 50-year period, about a dozen different studies from a variety of sources, government, academic, independent, all found consistently plutonium contamination in the Indiana Street Corridor. Colorado owes a great debt to the activists of the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. The monks and the nuns. Daniel Ellsberg, who went on trial in the 70s. That really brought to the forefront what was going on at Rocky Flats. Here you are, in fact, in violation of the federal law pursuant to the Atomic Energy Act of 1954. Dr. Johnson was hired as the director of Jefferson County Health Department in the mid-80s. He was asked by the Board of County Commissioners whether it was safe to build houses there. He told them he did not feel it was. He was excoriated by the Department of Energy and he was essentially fired by the Board of Health. There is a natural antagonism between public health and both business and politics. There were 400 buildings out there at the site. There were literally thousands of waste streams. Doing a search warrant would be the best chance to get information. Never before has an agency of the federal government served a search warrant on another federal agency. And all the evidence was presented to Colorado's first special grand jury. They finally decided they wanted to indict eight individuals because they thought there was an ongoing criminal enterprise at Rocky Flats. The Department of Justice said, you are not going to indict these individuals. We're going to settle instead. There were 18 other flight facilities that were being mismanaged. We're just giving in to pressure. Well, the pressure had to be from pretty high up. There was pressure by some of the surrounding towns to get the cleanup done so that those areas could be developed and the next two decades were spent cleaning it up. You have health departments now that are scrambling to defend what happened when it was federal agencies that were making these choices. The burden of proof is not on the agency creating the risky situation, it's on the community, it's on the people to prove that they actually were exposed. Most of the diseases that are caused by exposure to radiation, it's very, very difficult to attribute a cause. I tend not to be a conspiracy theorist, but I just feel they did a sloppy job and knew they'd never be caught at it. You know, I've walked across the Rocky Flats Refuge. It is beautiful. You cannot believe what a gorgeous, grassland it is right at the foothills until you think about what's probably below you. It's really important that people who are building homes, who are moving into homes, who are driving on roadways that might go through these areas, who are visiting a National Wildlife Refuge, are aware of what happened at that site before. We need to recognize that it's a contemporary, ongoing risk. And there's a fierce defensiveness about the site being safe among agencies and, and institutions that have a lot of power. 
I have read a great many studies from both sides. And clearly, there is pollution in the area. The disagreement has been over what are the risks. Best case scenario for the refuge is that whatever contamination there is has been so diluted through time and movement of land and water and wind that the chances of getting a dose that are going to cause cancer are so low that we don't have to worry about them. In 2019, Jefferson Parkway Public Highway Authority found a particle of pure plutonium dioxide, about eight microns in diameter, registering 264 picocuries per gram of radiation, which is five times higher than the level that was allowed by the Rocky Flats cleanup. That size particle can be entrained in the wind, and if we found an 8.8 .8 micron particle a couple miles from where the former industrial facility was, there must indeed be other hot particles elsewhere. These radioisotopes of plutonium are going to be around for a long, long time, far longer than human civilization has existed. And we forget, we're already forgetting. How do we communicate how important the site is, historically and environmentally? How about a thousand years down the road? We are capable of destroying the world several times over. That issue has not gone away. If anything, it's, it's more relevant and present than it ever was. But we've kind of gone to sleep. A sleep of obedience, the state of denial. What ordinary citizens can do is to wake themselves to this reality, to oppose this course to oblivion. It is now my great pleasure to introduce tonight's keynote speaker. A full professor of English and creative writing at the University of Cincinnati, she is the author of multiple books, including Full Body Burden, Growing Up in the Nuclear Shadow of Rocky Flats, which was selected by over 30 colleges and universities across the country for their common read first year experience programs. She is also the editor of multiple anthologies, including Doom with a View, Historical and Cultural Contexts of the Rocky Flats Nuclear Weapons Plant, which features essays from a number of our panelists and is on sale tonight. She is also the two-time winner of the Colorado Book Award and the recipient of the Ohio Arts Council Individual Excellence Award, the Barbara Sudler Award for Nonfiction, the Reading the West Award in Nonfiction, the Alumni Award for Creative and Academic Achievement at the University of Memphis, the Colorado Endowment for the Humanities Prize, the ANA Award for Journalistic Excellence, and fellowships from the San Jose Arts Council, Colorado Art Ranch, and the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. She was also selected as a Barnes & Noble Great New Writer and was the top finalist for the Barnes & Noble Discover Award. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, among many other popular outlets, and she has been featured in interviews on the BBC, NPR, Colorado Public Radio, and many other stations, including, as of this morning, KGNU. She has delivered numerous keynote addresses around the world and was selected as a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Bergen in Norway. In addition to her academic accolades, of which there are many that I have not had time to list, she is one of the kindest, most thoughtful, down-to-earth people I have met. Please join me in welcoming Regis University's Spring 2023 Chester Alter Scholar, Dr. Kristen Iverson.
Great. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Um, thank you so much, um, Abby, for, for such a wonderful introduction. It makes me feel sort of embarrassed. <laughs> thank you. And I, um, I want to thank all of you for uh, being here tonight and uh, coming, you know, in, in our kind of, you know, typical spring weather here in Colorado, I guess. Um, and I want to um, thank the faculty and administration here at Regis who brought me here tonight. I'm just so grateful for this uh, opportunity. And thank you to Nathan Church uh, and Jim Havey and Havey Pro for their hard work and commitment to making this, to making this documentary a reality. Um, we, it's been in the works uh, for a little while. We started before COVID and then things slowed down, of course, during COVID. And um, now we're ready to kind of, um, you know, bring it to fruition. What you just saw now is the short trailer. We have a longer trailer um, that I hope you will take a look at as well. I particularly want to thank my co-panelists here today, um, those who are here in person and on Zoom. Uh, several of them contributed to the book, as Abby noted, uh, Doom with a View historical and cultural context of the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant. And I really encourage you to, to check out this book. Um, each one of the essays and articles uh, has something very important to say. Um, a number of different authors, including some of the attorneys who have been involved with some of the litigation at Rocky Flats. So it's, it's a very important book. Okay, I'm going to... Um, begin with a little bit of summary. Uh, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the story already. As you know, Rocky Flats is one of the most important stories in the history of our country, yet many people have never even heard of it. Um, here in Colorado, we have our blinders on. We want to pretend that the story is over, that it's in the past, or that it never existed, or that it should be erased. Yet the Rocky Flats story is important for historical, environmental, political, and personal reasons. It begins in our own backyard, but reaches far beyond the borders of our own country. I'm here tonight to remind us all why we need to remember the legacy of Rocky Flats. So I'm going to begin with a um, brief history of the plant. Uh, the term body burden, um, which is part of the title of of my book, comes from the amount of radioactive material present in a human body, which acts as an internal and ongoing source of radiation. Plutonium, as you may know, has a half-life of 24,000 years, which means it would take 240,000 years for it to decay naturally. A millionth of a gram in the human body can be potentially lethal. The story of Rocky Flats begins with the end of the Second World War. In 1945, on August 6th and August 9th, 1945, the United States detonated two atomic bombs over the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The Manhattan Project had developed the bomb in the Met Lab at the University of Chicago and at Los Alamos, New Mexico. But the story quickly shifted to Colorado, the heart of nuclear weapons production in the United States. Rocky Flats began nuclear op uh, weapons operations in 1953 under the jurisdiction of the Atomic Energy Commission. It was owned by the AEC, uh, now the Department of Energy, the DOE, and operated uh, by Dow Chemical, and then later Rockwell, later EG&G, which uh, is a company that operated the plant when I worked out at Rocky Flats. Rocky Flats was part of a network of 13 nuclear weapons facilities around the United States. Unlike Los Alamos, where workers lived where they worked, right? If you worked at Los Alamos, you lived at Los Alamos. Rocky Flats was different because they had to depend upon workers who came from Arvada, uh, Boulder, Broomfield, Westminster, Wheat Ridge, all of the surrounding towns to work at the plant. When I worked at Rocky Flats, there were more than 6,000 people working there. It was a huge employer. Of the 6,240-acre sites, it's 16 miles northwest of Denver and 10 miles south of Boulder. The greatest contamination and hazards were and are 
and R in the 385 acre industrialized area at the center of the property, nearly 800 structures were built at Rocky Flats. At Rocky Flats, we produced plutonium pitzer triggers, uh, the spherical explosive that provide the atomic bombs chain reaction. The plutonium came from Hanford and Oak Ridge supplied the uranium, the enriched uranium. One thing I want to mention is that the location of Rocky Flats, in addition to needing uh, local workers and all of that, um, the site of the self, uh, the, the uh, placement of the site itself um, was incorrect. And whistleblower Jim Stone, an employee of Rocky Flats, is a person who is the one who first pointed this out. Um, the plant was based on wind patterns from the old Stapleton Airport. Um, rather than uh, from where it is located now. And we've all been experiencing the, the winds that we've had in the last few days. You know what these winds are like. Is they, the Chinook winds come down from the mountains and sweep over that site, and everything that's on that site is swept over the uh, Denver metro area. Here you can see um, what the site looked like before the cleanup. This is an aerial view. Nothing was visible from the road. The plant was responsible for research, production, stockpile surveillance, surveillance and transportation of nuclear material, and the production of between 70,000 and 90,000 plutonium triggers for nuclear bombs. As mentioned in the trailer, um, each particular pit contains enough breathable particles of plutonium to kill every person on Earth. Extensive toxic and radioactive contamination in the air and the water and the soil spread not just over the site but around surrounding areas. I'm going to show you a map in a moment. Um, and this was not just plutonium, although plutonium is probably of the greatest concern. Um, it also, uh, we dealt with americium, tritium, carbon tetrachloride, and other contaminants. Um, in fact, some of you may know the story from 1973 when tritium was which is highly radioactive, was found in Walnut Creek uh, that provided the, um, the water supply for Broomfield. Um, there's an interesting quote here. Tritium is a hydrogen atom with two neutrons in its nucleus, and one scientist noted, if you happen to be in the, atomic, in the atom bomb business, tritium is kind of a multi-purpose secret sauce. So we had some of that multi-purpose -pur secret sauce <laughs> in our water in Broomfield. They tested local residents to see if the tritium had worked its way into human bodies, and it had. So um, that involved a great deal of remediation I don't have time to get into today. Um, this is a photo of a glove box at Rocky Flats, and workers put their hands uh, into lead-lined gloves, and they, they worked with these boxes. This is um, a shot of a glove box line at Rocky Flats. And um, you might be able to tell, you can see at the top there, um, plutonium buttons were kind of moved down the line and then the workers would, would work on them as it, as it went down the line. The Department of Energy, previously the AEC, Dow, and Rockwell, denied that Rocky Flats was involved in nuclear activities or posed any danger to the public. And this is just one example of many, many, many newspaper articles. As I mentioned, there was contamination in the air and the water and the soil. Unknown to the public, more than 5,000 barrels stood out in the open for more than 11 years. Um, what happened with these barrels? Material laced with plutonium, they, um, of course, decayed and leaked into the soil, contaminated the groundwater, and were carried off site. I'm going to back up here a second. So you see this um, this ridge just behind <laughs> these barrels here. Um, my sisters and I used to ride our horses along that ridge. That's how close we were to the plant. Um, we rode our horses in the fields. We swam in Stanley Lake. Um, my parents thought they were raising their kids in the perfect environment. We were outside all the time. This is a shot of the plutonium processing building, the incinerator in the plutonium processing building in building 771. Um, and I think John Lipsky might talk about this a little bit tonight or, um, or um, 
some of our other panelists as well about the airborne contamination that came from things like this. At Rocky Flats, there were more than 40 fires over the years. The two biggest were in 1957 and 1969. Um, this is the glove box where the 1957 fire started. There was no warning, no information available to the public, and no evacuation. The 1957 fire was so extreme that it burned out filters, it burned out the measuring equipment. Plutonium was detected in a school playground 12 miles away. This is a map, all this information is based on Department of Energy information. This is a uh, map of the plume from the 1957 fire. The Mother's Day in 1969 traveled a very similar path. My childhood home was roughly um, right under the letter A there, if you can see that of Arvada. So now I'm gonna shift gears um, quickly here and, and talk a little bit about my personal story. You may have heard the phrase, the personal is the political. Rocky Flats is a perfect example of this. The plant in all its secrecy and contamination affected the lives of workers, local residents, scientists, activists, politicians. I wanted to tell the story of Rocky Flats from the viewpoints of all the people who lived the story and continue to live the story today. This is the nuclear legacy of Rocky Flats, but it's a living legacy. I grew up near Rocky Flats and later, like many of my friends and neighbors, I worked at the plant myself. Like many families, my parents moved to Arvada to raise their children in what they thought would be a perfect environment. We had horses, dogs, cats, a goat, lots of animals, and we were outdoors all the time. As I mentioned, we rode our horses in the fields and we swam in Stanley Lake. Our first house in Arvada was uh, in, in what is now kind of called Old Arvada. <laughs> and then in 1968, when I was uh, 10 years old, we moved to a uh, subdivision out near Stanley Lake and we were much closer uh, to Rocky, Rocky Flats. When, um, when my parents bought their house, they had to sign a Rocky Flats advisory notice in order to get a HUD loan from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And that advisory, I don't know if you can see it here very well, but it says you should be aware that there exist within portions of Boulder County and Jefferson County, Colorado, varying levels of plutonium contamination in the soil. But they said, it's okay, don't worry. And my parents felt that, and they said that, surely the government or one of the plant operators would tell us um, if the site was unsafe. We could see the water tower from our back porch. At night, from my bedroom window, Rocky Flats looked like a shiny little city on the horizon. But there was no environmental regulation at Rocky Flats. That came very late in the game but the contamination in the air, water, and soil was taking its toll. We began to hear stories about cancers and illnesses in families and in animals. Two of my close childhood friends died of unusual cancers. Veterinarians reported abnormal cases of cancer in dogs, um, particularly with one uh, veterinarian that I interviewed in the paws of dogs from you know, touching the ground. Even though workers were forbidden to talk about their jobs and a huge veil of secrecy surrounded Rocky Flats. Oop, Abby. <laughs> Help. Surrounded Rocky Flats. People began to talk. There, thank you. I'm an English major. Um, as you could see uh, from this map, this shows contaminated uh, residential areas around Rocky Flats, and this particular exhibit comes from the Cook v. Rockwell lawsuit. In 1976, the year that I graduated from high school, a neighbor, Lloyd Mixon, who owned a farm six miles north, sorry, southwest of the Rocky Flats plant, told state officials, state health officials, that he believed the facility was responsible for deformities and deaths in his farm animals, including pigs, ducks, and chickens. Health officials attributed Mixon's problems to bacterial infections. 
and nu nutrient deficiencies, but they, quote, did not entirely rule out radioactive leaks from the plant. They admitted that water on Mixon's farm contained high levels of radiation and, quote, excessive amounts of a number of other, other elements, some potentially toxic to man and animals. Robert Gettler, the Director of Health, Safety, and Environment at Rocky Flats, stated that although many of the facility's safety programs were implemented as a result of past accidents, he considered it one of the, quote, safest plants around. Lloyd Mixon used to appear at um, meetings and bring this particular pig whose name was Scooter um, and ask, you know, tell us the truth, tell us um, what is happening at the plant. So the EPA reported cattle near Rocky, Flat, Rocky Flats had more plutonium in their lungs than cattle at the AEC Nevada test site. So the protests began. And they had always been there from the beginning, but in the 1970s, they really picked up, picked up steam. This is a photo of poet Allen Ginsberg and some of the others and members of the Rocky Flats Truth Force um, who sat on the tracks. Um, here's another photo of protest. Here's a photo of Daniel Ellsberg in 1978. And I just want to take a moment to honor Daniel Ellsberg, who is very ill at the moment and um, has been part of a big part of the um, Rocky Flat of the efforts at Rocky Flats to get the truth of what was happening and what what has happened in the past and what's happening now. In October 1983, 17,000 people came locally and from around the country to join hands around the plant. Now I'm going to shift gears again and tell you a little bit about my story very briefly. After high school, I married and I went to Europe to work as a travel writer. I was living and working in West Germany when the Berlin Wall came down. My first son, Sean, was born in Germany. Uh, I came back to the United States, and it was declared that the Cold War was over. But it turned out that the Cold War was not over. It was still going on in my own backyard. My marriage ended, and I became a single parent with two toddlers to raise. I started graduate school at the University of Denver, and I needed a job. I had friends and neighbors who worked at Rocky Flats. The pay was good, the hours were flexible, and I thought it was clean. After all, they had just changed the name to the Rocky Flats Environmental Technology Site. <laughs> you can imagine my shock and surprise when I learned it was not clean, it was not safe, and I was working next to 13.2 metric tons of plutonium. I was at risk, my boys were at risk, our neighborhood was at risk. In 1995, while I was working at the plant, the DOE announced that the cleanup for Rocky Flats would cost more than 70, th sorry, $37 billion and take 70 years to complete. The day I quit my job was the day I knew I would someday write a book. And so we had a cleanup of sorts. Some people, including some former workers, call it a cover-up rather than a cleanup. The accelerated closure of Rocky Flats was completed in 2006 at a contracted cost of $7 billion. Removal of visible buildings and surface contamination was declared complete. Nearly all underground contamination was left in place. And measurable radioactive environmental contamination in and around Rocky Flats will likely persist for thousands of years. As you can see from this chart, another court exhibit, the top three feet allow plutonium at 50 pico, picocuries per uh, gram of soil. Three to six feet is 1,000 picocuries per gram of soil, and below six feet is unlimited. As mentioned in the, in the clip that you saw, 1,308 eight acres are so profoundly contaminated as to be permanently closed. As I mentioned earlier, plutonium has a very long half-life. I just want to mention um, a couple of the people. I have interviewed so many people, talked to so many me people, neighbors, workers, friends, um, who are ill. One of these people, and passed away, one of these people is uh, Rocky Flats DOE manager, Charlie Wolf, 
who battled unsuccessfully for compensation for the cancer he developed at Rocky Flats. When I was working at Rocky Flats, um, he was one of the few managers who would go down into the so-called hot areas with his employees. Another person I want to mention is my neighbor and friend, uh, Tamara. Um, she has had surgery for numerous uh, brain, tumor, brain tumors. Her family um, lived directly downwind from Rocky Flats on Stanley Lake. So they were exposed to contamination in the air and the water and the soil. So these are just two very brief examples of so many, many stories. So where are we today? The Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge was created in 2007 and is open to the public. You can go hiking and biking out there. As I mentioned, the core 1,300 acres is still closed. We're building homes all over the place out there. New home construction continues without restriction. And we're facing so many dangers. This is an active site with constant erosion from the wind and the snow and the rain and the animals, the prairie dogs, the deer, the animals, um, and then of course the snow and the wind and the rain. In 2017, there was a flood. Um, you may remember that flood that breached the site. This is a uh, neighborhood right near Rocky Flats. And then of course, um, the Marshall Fire in 2021 uh, which um, spread across the western parts of Boulder County, Superior, and Louisville, and um, was the most uh, destructive wildfire the state has ever witnessed. It destroyed a hotel, a shopping center, and more than 1,000 homes, and came dangerously close to the Rocky Flats site. And then, of course, as I mentioned briefly, um, public health, so many illnesses. We have never had an adequate health study at Rocky Flats. We've never had an adequate epi epidemiological study at Rocky Flats. Um, we have been collecting stories, um, and many of us here on this panel have been working on that for years. Hundreds and thousands of people um, who are reporting illnesses. And yet, when people call or email me or any of us here on this panel, we have nothing to offer them. There is no hotline. There's no public health support. Um, there's no warning, right? If you're going to buy a house out there, um, you know, you might not even know that any of this ever existed. And then um, the latest thing, and I'm just going to touch upon, and I think one of our panelists may talk about this a little bit more, uh, forever chemicals. In July 2022, the five-year review report for Rocky Flats, which is part of the ongoing monitoring of the site, conducted by the DOE, EPA, and CDPHE, revealed the existence of PFAS, so-called forever chemicals. In October 2022, the DOE confirmed that PFAS have been detected in Rocky Flats groundwater, surface water, and landfill leachate. Exposure to forever chemicals has been linked to cancer, weakened immune systems, decreased fertility, and other health effects. Toxicology studies are underway, but as of now, the site is rated as protectiveness deferred. So what do we do? And I'll conclude by saying that this is, this is my wish list for what I would like to see happen. We need to preserve the memory of what happened at Rocky Flats. We need to educate and inform the public of risk from people who want to use the wildlife refuge to people who are buying houses or thinking about buying houses out there. Number two, we need a museum. This is a, such an important historical site, environmentally, historically, in terms of public health. We have no museum. We have no signage. You can drive down 93 or Indiana or whatever, and the only thing you see is open fields and beautiful space. You will not see a sign. Maybe you'll see artist Jeff Gipes famous red horse, but there are no signs that say what happened at Rocky Flats and why it's important. Signage is important for historical reasons alone, never mind all these other reasons. Years ago, many people recommended that we make Rocky Flats a permanent sacrifice zone. That didn't happen. 
But we can act now. We are losing the history of Rocky Flats here in Colorado and beyond. We are eager to forget this history. Some people, some organizations insist that nothing happened, that the past doesn't matter. Let sleeping dogs lie. The site is clean and safe and we don't have to think about Rocky Flats anymore. But this is a whitewashed version of the story from the past to the present day. This is not the full story and this is not the true story. We are allowing the dark history and nuclear legacy of the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant to be erased, and we cannot let that happen. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to our panelists now. Thank you so much, Kristen, for that powerful talk. It is now my pleasure to introduce Nathan Church, award-winning filmmaker with Havy Pro Cinema and producer, writer, and director of the Full Body Burden documentary, who will be moderating this evening's panel. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, my job is pretty easy. It's mostly just to introduce these fine people sitting next to me and, l and let them uh, set them loose. So I'm gonna dive right into that. Our first uh, speaker tonight is Dr. Mark Johnson. Uh, Mark Johnson attended medical school at Loma Linda University and finished a residency in preventative medicine and public health at Johns Hopkins. He was the executive director of Jefferson County Public Health for 31 years before retiring in 2022. And he's also the immediate past president of the Colorado Medical Society. And he is this gentleman just to my right or left. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> my wife told me not to mumble, so I am going to do my best to project. I am not an expert in Rocky Flats. I don't even consider myself to be a true scientist, although my career in public health included using bits and pieces of the social sciences, medical science, environmental sciences, some of the mathematical sciences, and perhaps most importantly, political science. Although I have read countless reports, spent hundreds of hours in public and private meetings, and read numerous books about Rocky Flats, I am still overwhelmed by the expertise of folks like my fellow panelists here tonight. They are the true experts. I have somewhat fallen into this group by making one comment. Fortunately or unfortunately, it was on camera while being interviewed about Rocky Flats by a television reporter. He asked me if I would buy a house in one of the new subdivisions on the south edge of the Rocky Flats buffer zone. And I replied, no, I probably wouldn't. That bold response seemed to make me more new friends and more new enemies than probably anything else I have done in my career, with the possible exception of enforcing a mask mandate. <laughs> Recently, in thinking about Rocky Flats, I have tried to put myself into the shoes of those making decisions. What might they have been thinking? Much of what I say will sound judgmental. This will just reflect my character flaws as I project onto others what I might have done. I've broken the groups into three, the commercial contractors, the government agencies, and the scientists of the various fields of training. When Rocky Flats was first started, I believe all of these groups had ample reason to believe they were doing a good thing. Based on the intelligence we had about the Russian and Chinese activities, it seemed apparent that we needed to build a nuclear arsenal. In 1989, however, it seems to me that the thoughts and motives of each of these groups had to have shifted. The evidence I have seen as to the activities of the various commercial contractors seems to support the ancient wisdom that the love of money is the root of all evil. Greed can be exceptionally deceptive to oneself, especially if you can clothe it with something honorable, like 
religion or patriotism. The patriotic covering that was easily applied by the contractors to their often nefarious activities at Rocky Flats probably allowed them to sleep at night. When I put myself in the position of an agency official, I am struck by a fear of loss, both of my job and of the budget over which I am responsible. Again, one can seldom accurately judge the motives of others, but I believe that the decisions that were made by federal, federal government agencies and officials, both before and after the raid in 1989, focused in large part on the astronomical costs involved in an appropriate disposal of nuclear and hazardous wastes and the anticipated cleanup of the area. Hovering over all of the discussions and decisions would also be the potential lawsuits from those that would seek redress for exposure to risks at Rocky Flats. Those costs at Rocky Flats, however large they might be, would be dwarfed, however, by the cascading effect this would have on the cleanup, remediation, and lawsuits related to all of the nuclear sites in the US nuclear weapons program. To keep my job and to protect governmental budgets, the dangers and negligence at Rocky Flats had to remain hidden. For me personally, however, the saddest decisions involved the calculations that seemed to have been made by some of the scientists. I would have known that cancers and deaths, even if rare, would result from working or recreating on Rocky Flats land and from living downwind from the site. I fear that I might have justified some of my decisions with the belief that there would never be a way to successfully prove the causes of those illnesses or to hold me responsible. For my position and my reputation, I might have just gone, gone along to get along. After my television interview, I received numerous calls from former workers at Rocky Flats. Some insisted that working there was the best job they ever had and that they believed the nuclear exposure had added years to their life by strengthening their immune systems. Most of them, however, wanted to share with me information that they felt was being concealed or forgotten. About where nuclear and hazardous waste had been buried much of it in the buffer zone outside of the cleanup zone. About safety procedures that had been ignored or actively flouted by management. Or about the procurement of testing samples that was manipulated to get the desired results. The Western states in this country have long been used, polluted, and abandoned by government and commercial interests in the East. Rocky Flats is just another one of those sites in that long history. The difference, however, between it and many of the other sites is that it will continue to cast its shadow of pollution, illness, and death for tens of thousands of years. Thank you, Mark. Our next panelist is Michael Ketterer. Michael is Professor Emeritus of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Northern Arizona University, and he's currently engaged in studies of plutonium in the offsite environment at Rocky Flats, focusing on the presence of fire-related plutonium dioxide particles in soils and airborne dust. Dr. Michael Ketterer. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan, and thank you. Kristen, and thank you to Abby and the folks at Regis, and welcome to everybody. Thank you for coming. I am in a very cut and dry discipline. Chemical analysis is my business, really, and it's kind of a business of calling balls and strikes. You put, uh, you take a sample, you put it through some series of preparative steps in the laboratory, and then you get a result. And based on that result, uh, you make conclusions. 
and test hypotheses and do things like that. So it's a very cut and dry discipline, but I've really been attracted to uh, Rocky Flats and its footprint on uh, its surroundings. And I can't get out of my mind the fact that there's really a hot spot here on a national level of plutonium in soils at Rocky Flats. I've studied plutonium in many locations uh, throughout the world, but uh, this is locally near Rocky Flats. It's kind of a hot spot. But more recently, I've been focusing my attention on two things. One is the presence of plutonium dioxide particles. And uh, I've invented or created a assay that we can do in the laboratory that finds these particles. Essentially, we take a sample that's uh, uh, sieved to 75 micron small particles, uh, silt and sand, fine sand and silt and clay sized particles. And then we analyze small masses of this dozens of times or maybe even a hundred times and compare the results. And you get a pattern that's shown uh, in the bottom middle there. You see kind of a steady baseline of plutonium concentrations, but then there's some outliers. And those outliers encircled there represent plutonium dioxide particles. So uh, I've been applying this measurement technique to soils in the proximity of Rocky Flats. So uh, we've seen already the uh, map in the top middle there is the so-called Hardy Cray map uh, that was developed by the US government in uh, about 1970 when they first admitted that yes, there's offsite contamination uh, of soils with plutonium uh, coming from Rocky Flats. Um, I've studied portions of this area, and uh, in the top right uh, panel, you see there, there's some white dots. I've taken soil samples from those areas, and in all of these places, we find uh, abundant PuO2 particles, plutonium dioxide particles. They range from uh, about 0.2 microns is the smallest we can detect with this particular type of measurement and they go up from there. The largest one that I've found in the Rocky Flats proximity is about three microns. All of these would be considered in, to be in the respirable range and also in the, they're, they're small enough to be respired, but they're also small enough to move with the wind. So if you look at the top left there, what I'm thinking about next, in addition to characterizing the presence of these particles in many other locations, what I'm thinking about next is there needs to be some real-time air monitoring under, I'd call it, episodic high wind conditions. That's a fancy way of saying the weather we had here at the end of last week. Uh, I was not here, otherwise I might have been tempted to go out there and uh, use some technology like is shown in the uh, lower right-hand corner. I'm a big believer in citizen science, despite you know having access to a lot of good tools to measure unusual things like plutonium, but uh, I am a big believer in citizen science. I work with a lot of community members, and uh, there's a prototype that I put together in my garage shown at the uh, uh, bottom right there. It's a leaf blower. My wife told me immediately, you better get your own uh, blankety blank leaf blower, don't use mine. <laughs> but the idea here is this is a sampling device that somebody can carry around, it's battery powered, it'll run for 30 minutes on uh, one charge. And uh, if you look closely, there's an N95 mask taped to the air inlet of the blower. So what I'm really interested in doing next is to try to see under high wind conditions, how much Rocky Flats related contamination, in particular these PuO2 particles, uh, how much of that is blowing around? Uh, we know that they're there. We know that this area remains contaminated, more or less as shown in that Cray Hardy map. That's not a lot has changed since 1970. That contamination is going to continue to be there. Uh, but we, we need to I'd say perpetually monitor the environment in this area. And uh, um, I, I just say it's something we should never lose sight of because these radioisotopes are there for a long, long time and uh, they are going to be continue to be transported, excavated from the central operating unit by prairie dogs, just erosion of soil. Uh, 
couple hundred thousand years is a long time in terms of how the Earth's surface can change. So thank you again, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Michael. Our next panelist is joining us via Zoom. Uh, Randy Stafford is a senior manager at Oracle with a 35-year career in software architecture. He holds a Bachelor's of Science uh, in Applied Mathematics with graduate coursework in Computer Science from Colorado State University. Randy has contributed to four books on software architecture and speaks frequently at software conferences. His mother grew up in Arvada and her siblings worked at Rocky Flats. Randy served on the Jefferson Parkway Advisory Committee and also contributed to Kristen Iverson's second book about Rocky Flats, Doom with a View, which is on display and here for purchase tonight. So please welcome Randy Stafford. Uh, thank you, Nathan. Could I get a thumbs up if you could hear me, please? Yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you so much. So. Um, I'd also very much like to thank uh, Kristen and Abby and Regis University for including me on this panel. I am uh, truly honored to join this group of distinguished panelists, all of whom, as, as you've already seen, have extremely important perspectives on Rocky Flats history and its implications. Um, I am a third generation citizen of Jefferson County, Colorado. And as Nathan mentioned, I am an enterprise software architect by profession with education in applied mathematics and computer science. My mother and her siblings uh, grew up in Arvada. Her brother, who is a civil engineer, worked on the design and construction of some of the buildings at the nuclear weapons plant. And her sister was employed at Rocky Flats from 1986 through 2001 as a queue cleared hands-on chemical operator in buildings 371 and 771. The 1957 fire at Rocky Flats happened on my mother's 17th birthday. She was a junior at Arvada High School. She is a survivor of breast and pancreatic cancers, cystic ovaries, and a cystic kidney that were surgically removed and also a survivor of thyroid issues. There is no family history or lifestyle risk for any of those conditions. Anyway, I read Full Body Burden when it came out in 2012 on the recommendation of a dear friend of mine, Ramona Gaylord. A few years later, I read it again and sent Kristen some fan mail saying, the thing that worries me most now is the Jefferson Parkway. Can you imagine big earth movers digging up miles of ground along Indiana Street, especially on windy days, uh, which is what was just alluded to by my colleague, Dr. Ketterer. If it looks like that will move forward, I will probably become politically active against it, just on the principle of the thing. This was uh, circa 2015 when I wrote that. Well, <clears throat> Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, the Jefferson Parkway is an initiative by the governments of Arvada and Jefferson County to build a toll road from Highway 93 between Golden and Boulder to Highway 128 at Interlochen. It is claimed to complete the beltway around Denver, but two more projects would be required to connect it to C-470 on the south and the Northwest Parkway on the north. Importantly, the Jefferson Parkway's route goes up the west side of Indiana Street, which is the eastern border of the Rocky Flats uh, National Wildlife Refuge, between Highway 72 on the south end and Highway 128 on the north end. And this stretch of land, as Dr. Ketterer and others have commented, is well known to be contaminated with plutonium from specifically the 903 area at the nuclear weapons plant. There is a plume of windblown plutonium that actually crosses Indiana Street right in that stretch by the old uh, uh, Eastgate Road and, and um, Woman Creek Reservoir. So this is the theme of my remarks tonight. The Jefferson Parkway 
as a prime example of the public health risk still posed by Rocky Flats contamination, especially when that risk is exacerbated by imprudent decisions of governments at all levels, local to federal. So in 2017, I applied and was selected to the Jefferson Parkway Advisory Committee, a, citizen, a citizen's advisory committee established by the Jefferson Parkway Public Highway Authority's Board of Directors. My motivation for applying was to have an opportunity to formally advise the JPPHA board of the public health risk of disturbing plutonium contaminated soil for construction of the parkway. The issue is, as others have already commented, that the plutonium particles contaminating the land are of respirable size, uh, roughly 10 microns, and plutonium is documented to be carcinogenic if inhaled. Um, it's documented by the Agency for Toxic Disease and, and Substance Registry. Uh, so disturbance of the soil in the parkway right-of-way risks resuspension of plutonium particles into the wind, and that's a windy area, where they could be breathed by downwind citizens. So the opportunity that motivated me to join the Jefferson Parkway Advisory Committee was realized when the committee made its final report to the JPPHA board. Uh, for my work on the committee, I conducted extensive research into past studies of soil contamination at and around Rock the Rocky Flats site and of the existing epidemiological studies of cancer incidents in the surrounding population. I believe I identified and, and synthesized every study of, of on-site and off-site soil contamination and um, epidemiology in the history of the site over the last 70 years. Um, so I, I synthesized these findings into a position paper for my peers on the advisory committee. And that position paper is published still on the JPPHA website. And it formed the basis for my chapter in uh, Kristen's second book on Rocky Flats titled Doom with a View. That position paper was read by a member of the Broomfield City Council just when JPPHA's executive director was requesting $1.5 million budget allocation from Broomfield and the other JPPHA partner governments to fund JPPHA's procurement process for a parkway construction contractor. This was right about December 2019, or no, 2018, I'm sorry. Um, so after uh, intensive civil engagement uh, with Broomfield by several of the panelists here and many other people, and uh, as a result of JPPHA's finding in August 2018, of a 264 picocurie per gram plutonium particle in the parkway right-of-way along Indiana Street, the Broomfield City Council voted unanimously in February 2020 to withdraw from the Jefferson Parkway Public Highway Authority and terminate its support for the Jefferson Parkway. So by doing that, Broomfield set a stellar example of responsible health-conscious governance regarding Rocky Flats, and it was not the first time Broomfield had done so. You may remember Kristen's comments about tritium in the Broomfield water supply. And back, um, I think this was in the late 70s or, or 1980s, Broomfield caused the Department of Energy to fund the construction of a new water supply reservoir for Broomfield because of the tritium contamination. So Broomfield had a history of protecting itself from Rocky Flats contamination. Um, nor was it the only time a local government had uh, exhibited responsible health conscious governance regarding Rocky Flats. The town of Superior has done similar things by refusing to participate in the uh, Rocky Mountain Greenway um, Federal Lands Access Program grant uh, to connect the Greenway Trail through Rocky Flats. So there are a couple of local governments that have recognized the risks and protected their citizens. Um, Arvada and Jefferson County, unfortunately, are not among those local governments, and they would do well, as would the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, to follow Broomfield's example. Fish and Wildlife, of course, 
opened access to the Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge to the public, um, the refuge is formerly the buffer zone around the plant, was not remediated in the, in the cleanup project and is still contaminated with PFAS and plutonium and other things. And the trail system in the refuge goes right through um, some of the contaminated parts of the site. So this is what I would like to leave you with um, that are here tonight and thank you, um, that, or that will watch this recording in the future. I would like to leave you with the idea that the history and the scientific studies are out there. Um, all you have to do is research them. And furthermore, civic engagement really works. Uh, if you are concerned about the public health risk posed by residual Rocky Flats contamination, please educate yourself about the issue and contact your elected officials to urge them to not exacerbate the problem by disturbing contaminated soil with any kind of development projects or by allowing public access to contaminated sites. Um, so a great starting point for educating yourself is Kristen Iverson's books, Full Body Burden and Doom with a View. And with that, I would like to thank you for your interest and, and your uh, attention, and I will yield the floor back to the moderators. Thank you very much. Thank you, Randy. Thanks very much. Our next speaker is Stephanie Malin. Stephanie is an associate professor of sociology and co-founder and co-director of the Center for Environmental Justice at Colorado State University. She specializes in environmental and natural resource sociology, governance, and rural development, focusing on community impacts of resource extraction, energy production, and environmental deregulation. Stephanie is also the author of The Price of Nuclear Power, Uranium Communities, and Environmental Justice, which is on sale here tonight. Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to Kristen and Abby and Regis for having us all here. Um, I am thrilled to be here as a social scientist on this panel because um, part of the way that I got involved in learning about what's going on at the site after reading Kristen's book, of course, was hearing from community members who were being impacted by ongoing health impacts of living near the site. And so this was a really important way of being kind of invited into these conversations. And I'll give you a little background in the brief time I have on what kinds of questions I'm asking and what we've been finding, and give a little overview of one of the chapters that's in Doom With A View that's part of this. So as a social scientist, I'm, I'm a sociologist. That a lot of people don't know what that means. I, I'm sure a lot of folks in this room don't know what that means. Most people think it means I'm a psychologist, right? So I'm, instead of studying people's internal experiences, I'm studying the systems and the structures and the institutions in which we're embedded. And as an environmental sociologist, I particularly study how we have created systems to interact with the environment. And I focus in particular on systems of industrialization, militarization, and extraction, and how that can create situations of injustice for folks who live in communities that host those military or extractive activities. And with Rocky Flats, we're kind of seeing the intersection of a lot of that, right? Given the history that Kristen gave you and that you're all aware of, right? This is um, a representation of US militarism. It's a representation of industrial pollution and production. And I'm really interested in studying the environmental justice impacts of that, right? So in this particular context, distributive injustice, so who is exposed to those bad things in the environment? We have hundreds of studies that show typically it's least powerful people in a society, people, communities of color, low-income communities, and often an intersection of the two, as well as who doesn't have access to the good stuff, right? Open land to recreate on that's not contaminated beneath the surface clean air, clean water, public transportation. And here we have a pretty good idea of the tragic distributive injustices that have occurred, but we also know what can continue to occur if we don't take action and especially make sure that folks are aware of the ongoing risks of the site. A really important component of environmental justice as well though is called procedural equity. So it means how did we get those distributive injustices in the first place, right? What decisions were made, what policies were created, and who had a seat at the table 
to meaningfully participate in making those decisions. It's the kind of background, the long game, in terms of how we get those injustices or the lack of access. And so here I think we can see why access to information, not just information, right, but information that's useful, that's translated so that folks don't have to have a degree in toxicology to understand what it means, and that isn't thousands of pages that you can access on the health department website, for example, right? So actually having access to information you can use to make decisions about your health risks that you might face. And so here, uh, and Dr. Ketterer mentioned civic science or citizen science, that's a really important component of this as well, right? Listening to the experiences of people who live around these sites, the health impacts they may experience, they're often doing popular epidemiology or mapping where households are in relation to possible contamination sites. There's a lot of savvy um, data collection going on there, but part of it is making sure the information is out there and that it's taken seriously by the institutions that actually make policy and regulate. So in this context, I think we can appreciate the significant procedural injustices, right? Lack of access to information, lack of seats at the table to decide what happened at the site the entire time it was operating, but also now in terms of the cleanup and what happens on, as Kristen said, this very active site, right? This isn't like it's just disappeared because we can't see what's going on on the surface. So people in this context, right, we have not been trusted or allowed to access the information that's needed to make decisions about, for example, whether or not we want to buy a home within um, a distance of the site that we might be comfortable with, right? At least having access to information to make those simple decisions. And this is where I kind of came into this study, because I focus a lot on the environmental health impacts of those contexts, right? So when people are exposed to the nuclear industry, be it in uranium communities or in communities that are making triggers for nuclear weapons, what sort of uh, environmental health impacts were there, right? If there's contamination and we have cancer clusters or clusters of reproductive issues, folks often make connections between those health problems and exposure to environmental contamination. But as you might expect, and as we've heard already, right, there's a, that's contested quite often. Either the presence of the illness, like with Gulf War syndrome, or the fact that those illnesses might be linked to environmental contamination. And this is an ongoing debate. Luckily, there's a paradigm shift going on where we're moving from the biomedical model to the environmental health model. And many folks at this table have led that and already are firmly in that, that new paradigm. So what our health study did, and, and Kristen's exactly right, that we have not had, there's not been a proper health study of the impacts, an epidemiological study of the impacts because really that needs significant state level support. The, the amount of time and resources that would go into that to do it well would be significant. What our research team was able to do was to start to take oral histories of folks living in the area who are experiencing rare cancers, rare diseases, or a combination of those things. We're fine, we, and our, our chapter details this as well, um, and I feel fortunate and privileged to be able to listen to and tell those stories because a lot of times those were the only times folks were able to talk about their experiences and get them on record and we tried to treat it as an oral history study, right? So we really dug into people's lifelong experiences and we shared those findings in, in Doom With A View in a way that really talks about how Rocky Flats continues that pattern of nuclear sites where folks have made the ultimate sacrifice and are still dealing with health impacts from those exposures. So our health study helps kind of bridge these legacies to how very current these outcomes can continue to be and still are. And I hope that it can start to serve as a catalyst for conversation and information that's accessible, that's understandable about the risks that may be faced if you were to recreate on the former site or buy a home within, within a certain proximity. So I, I hope I've made the case, and I'm happy to talk more about how access to information is so key, but it's also the ability to use that information to talk to and make decisions with institutions that are here to protect the public health. And I do have to say that I work with oil and gas communities, I work in uranium communities. This is the only study and set of studies I've worked on where the health department has shown up to try to denigrate our findings and where um, the health department has 
tried to get articles and things that I've published retracted for reasons that ultimately ended up not having any grounding. But it goes to show you the structural forces that are in place to keep that silence going and to continue that legacy of secrecy. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that we do everything we can to push back on that because we don't wanna see future generations impacted in ways that they've had no control over at all. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. Our next panelist is Niels Schoenbeck. Niels Schoenbeck is a biochemist by training. He received his PhD in 1973 and has taught college chemistry since 1978, now is an instructor at Regis University. From 1987 to 2003, he served on several governor-appointed committees concerning Rocky Flats that studied off-site environmental contamination, soil standards for remediation of the site, and the health effects of plutonium exposure. He currently teaches a course on nuclear technology and climate change as part of the core curriculum at Regis. Please welcome Neil. So for years I've been asking the question, uh, why can we not move beyond these um, debates and can't we have a solution? And so I'm just gonna tell you some stories, but I wanna frame them. Um, and you've heard this before, I'm sure, but I think the frame to consider all of this is profit before people. And uh, the next thing is, is that um, our political economy um, has been called neoliberalism, which is one of those uh, Orwellian doublespeak that you really have to go and research what does it mean. It's neither liberal nor is it new. And um, basically, um, it is uh, the neoliberal corporate world um, that is so um, commanding that uh, we really have to find a way to work with that. So I don't have an answer. I've been working with students since 1980 on these issues when Ronald Reagan came to power and he started immediately talking about conducting limited nuclear war, uh, one of the you know great oxymorons of our um, litany. And um, I was shocked and then my students started asking me, you know, what's an atomic bomb and what is he talking about? And so I thought I knew enough about this, but I didn't. Um, I, uh, my first contact with nuclear weapons, uh, not directly, but in, with fear, was that I lived through the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, as a teenager. <clears throat> so that got my attention, and I wanted to know more about nuclear weapons. Um, well, I got into biochemistry, um, and uh, I wish I had answers, but I don't, so I'm just gonna tell you a few stories. Um, one is that um, my contact here in Colorado with uh, Rocky Flats was signing that um, HUD document that Kristen mentioned when I first bought my first house in 1980, I think it was. And then I was talking to my friends who bought houses later and they didn't have to sign it. They had taken that, um, uh, you know, that warning away. It was just an example of uh, we don't want to tell you what's really going on because you might object and you might organize and you might become political. You might actually participate in our democracy, um, God forbid. Um, then uh, very soon after that, I had a chance of um, working at NCAR and by just chance, my office that I was assigned was right next to the office of Dr. Edward Martell. Some of you know his name. Uh, he was the first uh, person to, the scientist, to study plutonium off-site and uh, found 400 times what Rocky Flats said. And they debated him and they said, no, 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 that's not true. They went out and did their own measurements and then uh, like um, tail between their legs uh, found that, oh, it wasn't 400, it's actually 1,500 times what they thought was out there. Um, and so, uh, Ed Martel was very interested in um, how nuclear uh, isotopes and nuclear chemistry interacted with the biological world. He was trained as a nuclear chemist. Uh, he witnessed the first nuclear, uh, uh, I think the first, um, exp um, 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 
hydrogen bomb explosion, I think it was Mike, um, he was doing some scientific um, experiments, and it turned out that the yield was three times what they thought it would be. And he ended up dying of a, of a blood disorder that is associated with radiation years later. Uh, his family lived into the 90s, and I think he died at around 75. So his life was cut short by his exposure uh, to radiation, most likely. Um, so he wanted to know about biology because he was studying cigarette smoke. Cigarette smoke, the reason it gives you lung cancer is because it has the same kind of radiation that plutonium does. Tobacco leaves collect it, and then you smoke it, goes directly into your lungs, and uh, if you smoke 30 cigarettes a day, which I know you don't, but maybe you know some people who do, that's the same as getting, the same exposure as getting a chest x-ray for pneumonia. So 365 days a year of a cigarette habit, uh, just cut the, sm you know, drop the cigarettes and just go down to the ER every day before breakfast and get your chest x-ray and you'll have the same result. Um, so we traded. Um, I taught him what I knew about biochemistry and he taught me what he knew about uh, nuclear chemistry. And that's how I got into the Rocky Flats issue. Um, I, you, know, you mentioned that I was on several committees. I learned all the nefarious activities of agencies um, and uh, it was quite eye-opening. Um, one of the, uh, uh, you know, another piece is that uh, we throw around this uh, uh, term cleanup. Um, it's, uh, that's another Orwellian doublespeak. When, you know, you know when, when my family ex uh, asked me or I asked my, uh, my children to clean up the kitchen, that's called returning it to its original state before you cooked and ate, right? There's no returning Rocky Flats to the original state. You can't possibly do that. The best you can do is remediate. So whenever I hear the word cleanup, I know they're trying to pull the wool over my eyes. Um, so as far as uh, what I'm interested in in Rocky Flats is um, that <clears throat> we have a lot of plutonium unaccounted for. Much of it is off-site, sent off to Idaho, lucky boys over there. Um, but uh, we, we don't know how much is in the ground. The buildings at Rocky Flats went down four stories into the ground. Um, and some of them had plutonium. Uh, they didn't clean up below six feet. We have burrowing animals that Smallwood, a scientist, discovered that will go down to 16 to 20 feet in their burrows. And they're bringing up this soil all the time. So are they gonna stay out of the highly contaminated areas just for our sake? Um, probably they're just gonna dig, right? What should we be doing? We should be monitoring this. There are mounds everywhere. It wouldn't be hard to go out and sample it. Um, so I've argued for years, uh, look, turn Rocky Flats into a research park. Mm -hmm. You would not purposely dump that much plutonium into the soil just to see what happened to people. But since we did do it, let's take advantage and do a science uh, experiment with this and find out how does plutonium move? How does it affect people? But you don't want to know that because then you might have to do something about it. So there's, you know, a constant story of not looking and not telling um, for good reason, profit before people. Um, there was a, a soil scientist by the name of Iggy Latour who was hired by the Department of Energy to actually do these studies. And he had an incredible uh, system out there. He had three graduate students doing their PhD work um, and uh, he was the darling of Rocky Flats and Department of Energy because he didn't find the plutonium move at all. A, and his conclusion was, just leave it alone. Let the grass grow, everything will be fine. Until May 1995, where we had this incredible downpour, downpour, rain all the time, soaked the ground down to the bedrock so you'd have surface runoff. And guess what happened? The plutonium moved. And when he reported that, uh, they didn't like that. As a matter of fact, they fired him. And uh, his entire graduate program, I wish I knew who those people were and what happened to them. But it's just like you go to school and all of a sudden, up oh, bye. Um, he couldn't get his data. It was in the computers at Rocky Flats. He couldn't retrieve the data. Um, so it's, the, you know, I happen to know that because I know the guy. Um, and, but there are so many stories I don't know about. Um, at any rate, uh, my, my thing is, uh, you know, 
turn it into a research park to recreate out there, I mean, that is just crazy. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Niels. Our final panelist for this evening is John Lipsky. John Lipsky served the federal criminal search warrant at Rocky, the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant in June of 1989. The Rocky Flat Flats criminal investigation resulted in the cessation of Rocky Flats plutonium bomb manufacturing, additional covert camp contamination, and a controversial criminal plea agreement. After retiring from the FBI, John testified in the Marilyn Cook federal civil case that resulted in a $375 million settlement with the Rocky Flats contractors. Mr. Lipsky holds a master's in advanced study of criminology, law, and society from the University of California at Irvine. Welcome, John, please. Greetings. What a great introduction. I'm John Lipsky, and I live in the St. Brain River watershed. And in recognition of Dr. Iverson, who's also a Western Air, and the face of Regis University, Professor Abbey, and most importantly, all of you for being here tonight. Thank you. Denver was my first field assignment with the FBI in 1984. And while we were house hunting for a place to reside, my wife, Patricia, <laughs> pointed out that we should live as far away from Rocky Flats <laughs> as possible. True story. We knew nothing about the place. And we did. We lived in Aurora. <laughs> Caddy Corner. In 1987, I initiated an FBI criminal investigation of federal environmental crimes at the Rocky Flats Nuclear Weapons Plant. It has been an emotional whirlwind for the last 36 years, believe me. I, ex I executed two federal search warrants at Rocky Flats in June of 1989, and that picture that's up on the board is a picture that was taken, I posed for at Rocky Flats. My favorite um, backdrop is the flat irons, not the 771 stack. <laughs> The search warrant execution uh, caused the cessation of weapons-grade plutonium-239 bomb manufacturing. Rocky Flats was rightfully placed on the Superfund national priorities list. Our federal investigation determined Rocky Flats federal crimes with convictions in 1992. I truthfully testified before a Congressional Investigations and Oversight Subcommittee hearing, while Attorney General Bill Barr demanded that I recount, recant my testimony, but I didn't. I was involved in a nonfiction book. I testified in the 2005 Cook Federal Civil Trial. I had to, uh, ha I had to deal with uh, the Department of Justice uh, threatening to arrest me or, and put me in prison if I did testify. Well, I testified and they, I didn't go to jail. I've collaborated with representatives of threat of um, nuclear uh, worker for their unique claims. I was involved in investigating, testifying, and thwarting a 2015 planned controlled burn at Rocky Flats at the refuge itself. And I've been involved in petitioning the public to keep the Rocky Flats Refuge, the Rocky Mountain Greenway, and the Jefferson Parkway closed from public access, among other endeavors, endeavors to include enjoying great friendships out of my second tour here in Colorado, and I really appreciate it. To get to the grim stuff, regulatory capture at Rocky Flats began in June of 1989. It was on my watch with the state of Colorado and US DOE agreement in principle, US DOE initially paying millions of dollars to Colorado and Colorado continues to receive US DOE grant funds. Professor Malin talked about the, uh, the lack of uh, epidemiological studies that was part of the agreement in principle in 1989. 
Rocky Flat Stewardship Council is USDOE funded, over two million taxpayer dollars since 2006, should be defunded for not adhering to its legal requirements. Find out how good I am at this. Okay, I know what you're thinking. This old activist is bringing up the uh, photo album and wants to show old pictures, right? So this is a circa 1987 Rocky Flats photograph of the southeast corner of uh, showing in the, in the grids was the contamination that Rocky Flats had been involved in. In her own words that have echoed since at least 1986, quote, remediating the environmental harms caused by legacy defense programs is her leadership and tasked with maintaining a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent, carrying out the environmental cleanup from the Cold War nuclear mission, unquote. Those were her words. Has resoundingly failed the public. Our current U.S. Energy Secretary continues to neglect its legally mandated cleanup of the legacy Rocky Flat Superfund site. Refuge, Section 16, Jefferson Parkway, and the adjacent 20,000 acres that part of Candelas is in right now. Rocky Flats has been a U.S. DOE regu regulatory crime scene since 1974, a criminal crime scene since 1980, with the exploitation of ten techniques of neutralization, a theory of delinquency. You know, denial of responsibility, the victim, and injury. In 2021, the consequential contamination of plutonium, six times the standard, the Colorado standard, in surface water from the 903 pad, which is identified if, if it's big enough, um, the 903 pad is a historic open trench nuclear waste burial site. Was a, it was a recent remediation effort, notwithstanding a tri-party statement of dispute, in other words, the, the little kids didn't get along, that USDOE resisted with attempts of fraud. Yep, through the Stewardship Council, tried to fraud the, defraud the public. The mound, site plum, the mound site plume and East Trenches plume treatment systems tested positive for PFAS compounds as well as the upstream original landfill, all of which should have been remediated by at least 2006. So when activists bring up old pictures, there's a reason for it because they're still out there. You can't necessarily see them the way they used to be, but they're still out there. Now the covert contamination includes, among other suspicious USDOE maneuvers, PFAS compounds that have officially downgraded the public protectiveness of the Rocky Flats Superfund site. Professor Ketterer mentioned it. Uh, correction, Professor Iverson. <laughs> but Professor Ketterer and I believe that USDOE has not identified all sources of the PFAS contamination to remediate and in one particular elevated sampling point was purposely eliminated from further public scrutiny. It's documented. And then my last picture. Again, it's from 1987. The solar ponds were supposed to have been remediated in 1986. Then the agreement in 1989 USDOE agreed to remediate them and get rid of them, but they never did. So we have this solar pond plume treatment system in place. And just to the upper right-hand corner that's out of the box is the present landfill. And that one has elevated PFAS compounds that is contributing to the pollution in the area. Rocky Flats is currently not protective of human health and the envir environment due to a protectiveness deferred determination. With the reluctant discovery of Colorado regulated PFAS hazardous constituents, 
the Rocky Flats PFAS analytes, PFOA and PFOA, uh, PFOS, potentially contaminates the Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge, off-site and downstream users. We have information, USDOE information, that not all Rocky Flats PFAS sources have been identified for PFAS sampling analysis and remediation. In my personal opinion, this is to make the Department of Justice happy, with over 36 years of research, Rocky Flats plutonium pit production and waste disposal was never safe or sustainable. The U.S. Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982 is a failure and failed the public health. I predict that the disaster that the that disasters similar to Rocky Flats will occur at Los Alamos, New Mexico and Savannah River site. The current plutonium pit, pit production capacity law, 2015, will contribute additional nuclear and hazardous waste without nuclear repositories because they don't exist. Not to mention the necessity and public health burden to maintain plutonium pits on a regular basis. No, to finish up, to, no U.S. president has documented a solid waste exemption at any U.S. DOE nuclear weapons site, in, in part because it's not that the paramount interest of the U.S. to do so, right? But they want to risk our public health, and they want to do it in a secret way. And if I could ask young, younger people here, older people, anybody. Right now, DOE is having a town hall meeting at Los Alamos, New Mexico, talking about how they're going to build these new bombs at Los Alamos and Savannah River, and they're taking public input. Of course, we're here, but they're going to have more public input, and it's just say no. You don't have to be a, a scientist. If it doesn't make sense, and say that, but that's what I do. It doesn't make sense, right? They want to build 30 of these things, these plutonium bombs, by 2030, but they want to do it progressively. The, problem, the other problem at Rocky Flats that's not mentioned a lot, tritium was, is that the tritium's got to be taken out of the bomb, and the pit has to be scrubbed for the americium and other things that, that make it less than 95% effective. But where do you think that goes? And the tritium goes into the water and everything every 10 years. So as we get more bombs, I mean, the new START treaty is what, 1550, 1550 nuclear weapons that we have deployed? Every 10 years, they have to be maintenance. New tritium, scrubbed off the, the parts, more waste. And I thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, we had one panelist who unfortunately is under the weather and could not join us tonight, uh, Tiffany Hansen. She's the director of Rocky Flats Downwinders, and she's lived near Rocky Flats and been a public health advocate for years. Uh, in 2016, she partnered with Metropolitan State to initiate a health study of local residents, and in 2019, she was awarded the Roddenberry Catalyst Grant for a hemp phytoremediation study. She's currently working with local residents and activists to get signage put up near Rocky Flats. And Kristen, did you want to speak to Tiffany's cause? Yeah, I, I just very briefly um, want to point out uh, these particular slides that Tif Tiffany was going to talk about tonight. Um, we're so sorry that she uh, couldn't be here. She's done some really, really important work. As Nathan said, she is the director of Rocky Flats Downwinders, which is a tremendous organization that's done a lot of really important work. And one of the things that um, they did was they started tracking breast cancer in young women who live around Rocky Flats. And so this is very recent data. Um, I think it's 2019, uh, maybe a little bit earlier than that, in, uh, um, closer up to the present day. And as you can see um, from these maps, uh, the congregate of um, incidents of young, uh, breast cancer in young women, it, it really is uh, unusual and of 
deep concern, and um, I think this just emphasizes um, how important it is that we be involved and that we pay attention to this and that we don't let uh, DOE or CDPHE or whoever say, this data is not relevant. This is anecdotal dev evidence. Um, we don't need any, yes, we need studies. We need someone to, we need this data to be taken seriously. And so that's part of what uh, Tiffany was going to say, and so I just wanted to emphasize that. Thank but, you. Thanks, Kristen. So uh, we have powered through much of our Q&A time, but I wanna pitch a couple quick questions, and then I would also encourage the audience uh, to speak with the panel after the event. We'll be having a reception, and you can address your questions to people live and in person. We've had uh, several questions, though, about Candelas, the neighborhood right on the border of Rocky Flats, about whether there was any sampling done when they were building, uh, what people who live in Candelas uh, should know, and what it what about what it does to their property values. Um, would anyone like to speak to the Candelas issue? Sure. I'll give it a shot. No, I wouldn't buy a house in Candelas. <laughs> <laughs> and if offered a house, I'd board it up and make it a big billboard not to buy there. <laughs> But the Candelas folks did hire a engineering company and they supposedly went out and did some sampling. The uh, Jefferson County has uh, radiation regulations that they were trying to follow. But um, the snake oil is that a Geiger counter doesn't necessarily pick up alpha emitters like plutonium. So they weren't looking for plutonium and they signed off that everything was okay. They had, I'm not even sure if their, their PE or their professional engineer was a nuclear uh, trained engineer, which is part of the requirement. Um, th there's a checklist and um, I grin and bear it when I have to go out there to take some pictures, look around. But I, just the other day was 89 mile an hour gust at, at Rocky Flats. Well, Candelas is getting that. I know, and then I'll just finish it up real quick. Um, I know a, a real estate um, broker, and she will not sell homes in Candelas because she found out that when she did back in, what, 2012, 2013, the disclosure statements state that you can have a little garden but don't eat the produce from it. And I'd love to get my hands on one of those disclosures. I do have disclosures from Richmond Homes for somebody who was contemplating getting out of a contract, but it didn't say anything about the garden. So, um, I mean, I, I, you can trust your government, but verify. <laughs> May I add? Oh, yes, that, that we have Randy. Uh, I, I just want to say something very, very quickly um, with respect to this. Uh, the neighborhood where I grew up near Rocky Flats, no one talked about Rocky Flats um, for various reasons. They had parents who worked there or people were worried about their property values, which is the same kind of catch-22 that's happening now. People buy a house and they find out that the land is contaminated or their children get, are getting sick or they're getting sick. But if someone knows that that house is built on contaminated land, they can't sell the house, right? So this is happening again and again. But I get emails from people who live in that area who they are, um, they are ill or perhaps their children. Um, and they say the same thing that people in my neighborhood said, I'm afraid to speak up. I don't know what to do. I'm sick, my kids are sick. I'm where do I go, what do I do? So that same kind of secrecy and silencing is continuing to the present day. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. Randy, did you have something to add? Yes, thank you, Nathan. Um, Candelas is a, a wide development. It stretches from Highway 93 on the west to Indiana Street on the east, north of uh, Highway 72. <clears throat> and if you juxtapose 
the Cray Hardy maps and the other plutonium soil contamination studies that have been done over the years onto the subdivision plat, the um, the southwestern side of Candelas over by Highway 93 is not as contaminated as the southeastern portion right along Indiana Street, according to, for example, the Cray Hardy map. So it's it's it may be a little bit difficult to speak of Candelas as a whole, but um, about a month ago, I, I drove through the neighborhood and I saw two homes for sale in the very eastern side, uh, right on the border of the refuge, right by Indiana Street, uh, two homes for sale. And those those are, uh, according to Cray Hardy, the map, the Cray Hardy map, those are the most contaminated parts of the neighborhood. Um, but also, the, uh, Candelas is not the only neighborhood to be wondering about. Um, a couple of years ago, Fox News carried a story about a couple of residents of Five Parks, which is on the northeast corner of Indiana Street and um, 82nd Avenue. It's about a 1600 home development. And there have been two cases in Five Parks of an extremely rare heart cancer called cardiac angiosarcoma. And this is public, it was, it was, it's been in the news. Um, one of those cases was a gentleman named Brian McNeely who unfortunately uh, passed away from his cardiac angiosarcoma. And the other case was a teenage boy. And this is a cancer that's so rare uh, that uh, two cases in a 1600 person neighborhood would not be expected. And this is an example of the, um, frankly, inaccuracy of the predictions of the ResRAD or residual radiation software results that Department of Energy relies upon for predicting um, excess cancer incidents in a downwind population of a nuclear site. The, the, the ResRAD software models and estimates cancer incidents based on number of inputs, but its output is not validated against empirical evidence in, well, communities surrounding Rocky Flats. We've seen the, the breast cancer studies from Rocky Flats downwinders. Um, there's the um, uh, health survey by uh, Metro State University. And, and there, there is empirical evidence that contradicts the predictions of the DOE's official estimation software. Uh, so so, so th th those um, contradictions apply to more than just Candelas. They apply to Five Parks, Whisper Creek, uh, the eastern side of Candelas, the general Stanley Lake area. And uh, with that, I'll just close my response on that question. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Now, unfortunately, we have many, many more questions than we can get to tonight. But I, I, again, I would encourage you to all stick around for a little bit and chat with the panelists. Um, as you can tell, each one of these panelists could give an extremely engaging uh, presentation all on their own. And they've all been working on this issue, uh, giving of their time and expertise so I'd just like to thank all of our panelists for joining us this evening and thank you for their work on this subject. Uh, a special thanks to Kristen Iverson for her writing on the subject. She really brought all of these people together and she's certainly gone above and beyond the duties of any author uh, in, in pursuing this topic. And then finally, a, a special thanks to Abby Schneider and the Seed Institute and Regis University for making this happen. Uh, it, it was really Abby's initiative that made this event happen. To close, I'd like to make a special appeal to you as members of the community who are engaged and interested in the topic of Rocky Flats. Each one of these people on stage tonight has spent countless hours trying to keep the memory of Rocky Flats alive. And as Kristen's book has shown, storytelling is one of the most powerful ways that we can achieve that. My team at Havy Pro Cinema has been telling important stories of Colorado in the West for the past 40 years, and we believe that cinema is one of the most powerful and effective ways to keep a story alive. 
for the past couple of years, we've been working in conjunction with Kristen to adapt her book, Full Body Burden, into a documentary, but now we need your help. There are plenty of parties out in the world that would just assume the memory of Rocky Flats disappear and fade into obscurity. So tonight, we are kicking off a new public fundraising campaign to raise the funds necessary to complete this film. And to that end, Kristen has gener generously offered to match the first $15,000 worth of donations with her honorarium from tonight's event. So thank you to Kristen. And we're, we're seeking to match her seed funding with $15,000 in major sponsorships and $15,000 in supporting sponsorships by July 1st, which would allow us to complete this film by the end of the year. All donations are tax deductible, and they go through the International Documentary Association, who is our fiscal sponsor. And you can find the donation page by clicking on the QR code you'll find down at the far left-hand side. Uh, yes. You're right, my left. <laughs> and uh, that, that information will also be up at full body, fullbodiedburdenfilm.com very soon. And you're welcome to email me if you have any questions. My email's up on the stage, or on the screen there. Uh, there's a full list of sponsor benefits on the website, but each and every person who contributes to the film in any amount will be featured in the credits of the film and we welcome and appreciate all donations of all sizes. Uh, please feel free to share that website with anyone, uh, any other people or organizations that would be interested in bringing this important story to the screen. With the Wildlife Refuge now open for public recreation and housing developments and highways pressing at the former plant's perimeter, there's an urgent need for a broadened understanding of the Rocky Flats nuclear history. As John mentioned, the Department of Energy is currently sp spending billions of taxpayer dollars to restart production of the plutonium triggers that were formerly fabricated at Rocky Flats in New Mexico and South Carolina. The time to understand the lessons of the past and renew public debate on our nuclear future is now. I thank you for your interest and I thank you for attending tonight and please stick around and chat with our panelists and have a great evening. <laughs>